to number 335, Showers of Blessing. We're going to sing the first, second, and last of number 335. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshed. Yeah. 
shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us our fall. showers of blessing oh that today they might fall now as to God we're confessing now as on Jesus we call showers of blessing showers of blessing we need mercy drops round us are falling tell you we got showers this morning didn't we we were sitting here in church and brother Reza was preaching up a storm in here and it was pouring out a storm out there uh, man it got dark in here almost eerie I was ready to run to the altar right then and there but uh, praise the Lord good to see you here tonight had a great time this morning with brother Reza here and his wife it was able to join him uh, this morning she since went up north to Gaylor to be with their daughter for the next couple of days but it's already been a joy having them. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Brother Reza is here for the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, to help us with a teenage soul winning revival called Operation Soul Storm. We'll be kicking it off at 9 o'clock in the morning with breakfast and then a 10 a.m. teaching time and then we're going to go do some soul winning break for lunch and then go back out, round up everybody, get them here for a service that evening and some games and so forth, but we're going to have a great time. Please be praying. That is the uh, prayer emphasis for the week even, ten, uh, 10 minutes a day for our Operation Soul Storm. Pray for our teenagers. Pray that souls would be saved. Pray for Pastor Jesse as he leads it all and heads it all up. Pray for Brother Eraser that he gets some rest this week. Uh, I got the idea to bring him here for this because last, uh, I want to say last summer, maybe early fall, he sent out uh, uh, something on social media saying that uh, I believe it was the 30-year anniversary since the first Operation Soul Storm. And you wouldn't believe where that soul storm was held right here in Flint, uh, our former home church, Landmark Baptist Temple, back then it was called. Uh, we were downtown area right near Whiting Auditorium, and uh, Brother Reza came and led those teenagers. I was at Bible college at the time, but my brother participated in that. He led his first soul to Christ because of that Operation Soul Storm, and uh, so I thought, man, how wonderful would it be to have him back to Flint 30 years later, do the same thing all over again. And so he said, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be doing these soul storms, but he agreed to come and do it, and we're really excited about what the Lord has. Had a fantastic message this morning on uh, being uh, Christians who go forth and do good works. And if you weren't able to hear it, it's on our Facebook page, and it'll be on our YouTube page in time. I encourage you to listen to it and uh, repeatedly listen to it good preaching there and we're excited to hear him tonight as well so I will shut up now so that we can pray and get him up here even sooner father we love you and we're grateful here to be tonight in your house we're thankful for your servant here to serve us and to preach to us and to give us what you've taught him uh, not just in the recent days but all throughout the course of his life and ministry thank you for his heart and thank you for his spirit Thank you for his wife willing to allow him to be here with us. Thank you for all these folks who are here tonight to hear and to learn and grow. We do pray, especially for the power of your spirit upon this service right now and upon uh, Brother Jesse and Brother Areza and all of our teenagers as they move forward this week. So very excited to see what you're going to do I remember a statement he made just this morning that you honor faith and he's here by faith and we're designing uh, this outreach effort by faith this week and we trust and know that you'll come through and answer in a big way. Would you meet with us tonight, please? Help us to focus and pay attention and hear what you have for us. We love you. We ask all of this in Christ's name tonight. Amen. 
You may be seated. Wonderful. We're going to go to number 216, Dwelling in Beulah Land. And I want to train you on this song. So when we get to the chorus, we sing, I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. And everybody's going to say, praise God. All righty. So I'm going to, I'm going to read the line and you say, praise God. We got to practice because you're not going to do it if we don't. All righty. <laughs> I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. Praise God. Wonderful. All righty. Now you got to do it with just that much, if not a little bit more, when we sing. We're going to do just the first and the last verse of number 216. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear. singing. Good praise God there. That's good stuff. I think the Lord is excited to hear that. It's time for our offering. Whenever we have a guest speaker, we take two offerings in the evening so that we can make sure we receive our general fund offering and then secondarily our love offering for the speaker. We always take the love offering second because I want you to be able to hear the speaker. I want you to get to know them a little bit and I want you to be able to have your heart touched by God so that you'll give in response to that as well. Amen. So thank you for your continued faithfulness in giving. This week we hit budget for the second week in a row. That's very exciting. $3,600.53. That's a whole $100 over budget. We're excited about that. So general fund offering right now. Pastor Jesse, would you please pray? Dear God, thank you for this chance to give to our church, a church that reaches this community, preaches the gospel, and sees boys, girls, teenagers, and adults saved every week. I pray and ask God that you help us to give to that ministry now in Jesus' name. Amen.
you, Brother Dix. We're going to go to 491, a shelter in the time of storm. We're going to just do the first and the fourth verse of number 491, just the four, first and the fourth on 491. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Secure whatever ill be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a weary shelter in the time of storm. Oh, rock divine, oh, refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is a rock in a wind. shelter in the time of storm. All right, it is my privilege to introduce to you Brother Oliver Areza, an evangelist going on 38 years, I believe we were talking about today, and excited about that because you don't often find folks that stay in the work of God for the long haul like that. Sometimes Satan takes them out, sometimes they take themselves out. Uh, sometimes the Lord just decides to take folks on home at 38 years in the ministry, preaching the gospel faithfully, serving in the role of evangelist. And churches need evangelists. They're vital to our operation, and uh, they come in and do special things like this. They travel, they plant churches, and uh, help in any number of ways. They're a gift to the local church, the Bible teaches, and we're grateful to be gifted with Brother Areza this week. And uh, I can't can't pump up the crowd at all because Talon, you're here to represent the stars, but Journey's not here to represent the stripes, and it just wouldn't be fair. But anyhow, Brother Reza, I don't want to take any more of your time, sir. Would you come and preach to us? Give him a hand as he. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a special first, don't we? All right, Brother Reza, come preach for us, please. All right, and well, it's going to be an exciting week, I think. Hey, Amen. These all, y'all recruited these all afternoon girls, is that right? Whew, I don't think we've ever had this happen before, amen. I've got to go redo my plans, amen. Well, praise the Lord. We're just hoping that God will give us a, an abundant harvest of souls for his honor and for his glory. And uh, I remember when Brother Fox had called me uh, over 30 years ago to do that first soul storm. Actually, Brother Fox, Brother Rick Fox called and said, I want to have a soul winning marathon. And I said, well, Brother Fox, I have an idea about some things that I've been wanting to do. And uh, it's not exactly like a, like a soul winning marathon, but I think, it'll, I think it'll, the Lord will use it to get a lot of people saved. And he said to me, well, let's go ahead and kick off the first one now. And uh, he said, let's do it now, and we'll help you any way we can. If you need us to help you buy something, we'll, he we'll help you do everything that we can. And the first one that I had, we had uh, didn't even have a name for it. But you could tell it was um, right at about the time of the uh, first, the Persian Gulf War Operation Desert Storm. I remember that uh, happened, uh, it must have been 1991. Because I remember on my birthday, January the 16th, I write that down, amen. And uh, I remember on my birthday, I was preaching for a man by the name of Brother Wigton, I think it was, in Bay City, Michigan. And I stopped to get a cup of coffee as I was driving home. And uh, I heard on the radio that they dropped bombs there in the Middle East and in Michigan. And I'll never forget that day, and I remember that summer of that year is when Brother Fox asked me to do this and didn't have a name for it, 
and I just was thinking about it, and I wrote several things on a board, and I asked the kids, I said, teenagers, what do y'all think fits what we're trying to do? And the teen said, we think that it's good to do Operation Soul Storm. So that's how the name came about, amen? Now, it was back 30 years ago in America. It was a different America, really. We're, we're changing so drastically. It makes me very sad, though I will never underestimate the power of God, amen? But uh, it's a different America. And I think we had over 400 first-time professions of faith during that first Operation Soulstorm, over 400 first-time professions of faith. You, you throw out those kind of numbers, and it's kind of hard to imagine it in this day, that, isn't it? Yes. It just seems so, like, out there. But that's the way it was then. And uh, kids were not as spoiled. They were way tougher than they are these days. And it was an amazing time. And, of course, I've had many of them all over America. And uh, I'm just very happy to be with the teenagers this week. And we trust that God will use it in a very, very powerful way. I've got some uh, Soul Storm, Soul Winning uh, cards that I'm going to be giving away. I have a few of them with me now, but sad to say, I placed a new order. I, I came up with a very new design on the Soul Winning card that we're going to use to teach Soul Winning. And uh, they, they're, they came to the office. They're supposed to be delivered to the office, my office, tomorrow. Well, guess what? I'm not at my office. I need them up here. So they're going to FedEx overnight them to me. So the good Lord will, and we'll have those on Tuesday for you. And uh, really, it's a neat design. It's got the digital camouflage and the Operation Soulstorm and all the verses. And it'll look real nice. Amen. You can use them when you go deer hunting too. Amen. With that camo and win a bunch of them old heathen deer hunters to the Lord. Amen. So thank the Lord for it. We're just so grateful. And... Um, been many, many, many young people led their first soul to Christ, and boy, that just thrills my heart. I remember doing one for Brother Fugit one time in the old auditorium before they before they built the gym. Then before they built a, the gym, they were using as a auditorium from the first one, and now they bit, have that big giant auditorium. Now they have the new one, and. Um, but I was in that, uh, the, the regular one, the small one right there, and uh, I remember one night, God just God did an amazing thing there, and we had a little over 30 teenagers leading friends and teenagers to the Lord at the altar. 30 in one night, 30, all across the altar, teenagers winning teenagers to the Lord. Boy, I thought about that, uh, just how amazing is that, Amen. So, boy, we're just going to pray that God will use this in a very, very powerful way and help us to lead, uh, lead a lot of teenagers to the Lord. I remember one time I was uh, going out soul winning with my home church. This is, I was a teenager, probably about 15, 16 years old. And I knocked on a door, and a young man answered the door. His name was Kevin. Kevin Kibble was his name. I don't think I turned my mic on, did I? All right, let's see if we can get that thing on there. These guys was looking at me very mean back there. <laughs> it's all right. I can take it. I can take it. Amen. And, um, and I recognize his last name because a, a girl, his sister was in my class at Mesquite High School. His sister was in my class. And uh, I was knocking on the doors, and he came to the door, and I recognized his name, and I had the privilege to lead him to the Lord. I don't remember how long it was, but he and uh, and four, uh, he and four other teenagers one evening got in a in a 1965 Ford Mustang, and they went out a drive going on to what's called a Pioneer. It was a Beltline. It was a, around the Dallas County. And there was a man that had gone to the State Fair of Texas right there in the downtown Dallas area, and he got drunk. He was drinking a lot, got drunk, and he left the fair park and uh, was driving erratic, driving fast, and the police started chasing him. So he came down Highway 20 or 80 to 635, got off on Eastgate, 
made a couple of more turns and was headed Beltline Pioneer out of Dallas, out of Dallas County at a tremendous rate of speed. It was just getting dark and he was running from the police with his lights off. And Kevin and five, I think five other boys got in that uh, 65 Ford Mustang and they were pulling out on Beltline Road and they didn't see this guy coming. His lights were off. And he pulled out. They pulled out in front of that man, T-boned him. Every teenager in that car was killed except for one. His name was Travis Blanton. His dad was my bus captain. He was a, His daddy picked me up on the bus when I was nine years old and started riding the Sunday school bus to church. Kevin was in that car, and he went to heaven. Now, I was so glad that my church had taught me how to take Bible verses and show somebody how to be saved. That's how important it is because kids, hell is real and people die. And when a person dies without Jesus, they have to pay for their own sins in hell forever. And the power of God is amazing. He can change drug addicts, dope heads, sinful people, highfalutin sinful people. He can take care of it, amen? And that's what Soul Storm is all about. Well, we're looking at Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 7. If you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter number 3 and verse number 7. And once you've found Revelation 3, if you're able to stand with me, let's stand together for the reading of the Word of God here. Revelation chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading with verse number 7. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy. He that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now this evening I want to draw your attention to verse number 8. The Bible says, verse number 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Now this is a promise that God has given to the local autonomous indigenous church. And he says, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Do you believe that? I believe that. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And that's what I'm preaching on tonight. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come now in the precious name of Jesus, and we ask for blessing upon the reading and the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, help me as I preach, and these as they listen. I pray that you'd help every one of us to get exactly what we need from the Bible tonight. We pray that you would help us to be alert and, Lord, to have a diligence about us, to desire, to want to make uh, the Scripture apply to us. Help us to forever be challenged by it and encouraged by it. Save the lost, reclaim the backslider, revive the Christian, for we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much for standing with me. 
You see, we have in this great missionary-minded local church of the Philadelphia, we see a re revival of prophetic truth. They were earnestly awaiting the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because he promised to deliver them from the very hour of temptation that will come upon the whole earth. Now, there is no doubt in my mind that God opens doors of opportunity for the gospel and for gospel preaching. And when God opens the door of opportunity for gospel preaching and gospel teaching, somebody has to walk through that door. Amen? Somebody has to walk through the door. Somebody has got to do it. But the one big mistake we make concerning these open doors is that God is expecting somebody else to do it instead of me. God wants us all to be a part of evangelizing. God wants us all to be a part of getting the gospel out. Amen? God wants us all to be a part uh, of this great work of the winning of souls. Amen? And God backs up His promise with these words, when I open the door, nobody can shut it. Amen? That's what God says. Amen? When He opens the door, nobody can shut it. You see... Don't ever forget who opens the door and who holds the key to the door, the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, we have to go back to verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 3 to learn this. He says unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. And the next part of the verse should strongly encourage us to never give up, thou hast a little strength. Amen. So the history of the early church testifies of the fact that God opens doors for the express purpose of preaching of the gospel. I want us to look briefly tonight as we lay a foundation for the message. I want us to look at a couple of examples in the New Testament when God opens doors for the preaching of the gospel to the Jew and to the Gentiles. I'm looking first of all in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 12. The Bible says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Did you see that? And a door was opened unto me of the Lord. So this verse talks about the door being opened by the Lord for the preaching of the gospel. I can remember a few times in my life that I feel like God did that for me. I can remember a couple of times in my lifetime when I feel like God did that for people that I know. I'm so thankful that our, my home church in uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia, God has given our home church an uh, inroad into the elementary school there, and we have a team of senior citizens that go in there once a month and they teach a Bible class. And they probably have maybe about anywhere from maybe a half a dozen to a dozen conversions every single month into that public school there in our hometown. Now there is no question in my mind that God opened that door. Amen? Now we don't know how long that door is going to be open, but God opened it, and there are consistently young children hearing the gospel, and they're being saved. Amen. God opens doors. Amen. A door opened of the Lord. In Acts chapter 14, verse 27, it speaks of a door of faith. This is what it says. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and now he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. God opened the door of faith, therefore furnishing an opportunity for the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. For several years now, I do some short-term mission work. My last missionary trip, I went to some southern islands in the Philippines there, and I'm partnered with a, with a man there that is doing a wonderful job at reaching this small community. And uh, he had asked me to preach in the jail. They have a jail ministry. And I went into this jail there, the church there. Now remember, the places like that in these third world countries, they're not anything like America, okay? They're just not like America. 
They, they're, they're really, it's, it's, it's really, they, they just don't have the care like some of the inmates have here in America. And uh, the church there, that little church that I was at in the Philippines had made a big old, big giant bowl of spaghetti and uh, didn't have meat sauce. It was just uh, a tomato sauce and spaghetti. And, uh, and then they, have, they, they learn to serve things and to provide things, spending very little money. So they had these little baggies, little baggies, clear baggies, and they scooped that spaghetti inside those baggies. Now, to be honest with you, it didn't look good. It didn't look good at all. I don't know if you can imagine what, uh, what uh, tomato sauce spaghetti looked like in a baggie, but anyway, you can just about imagine. And, uh, man, we took a big old thing full of them little uh, spaghetti in the bag into that, the prisons because they don't have all the programs. So the church goes in and feeds those prisoners, and the prison lets them bring the food in. And man, those guys were taking those little bags of spaghetti, tomato sauce spaghetti, and I'm telling you, they were gobbling that stuff up like if it was a T-bone steak. Amen. It was just absolutely amazing. I ain't even going to tell you what it looked like to me. Amen. But anyway, man, they were gobbling it up. And I got into that prison, and I remember when I started, the, the room was pretty packed, and there's nothing like preaching to a packed outhouse. I mean a packed out house. Amen. You've got to be careful the way you say that. Amen. Uh, there were men there and then there was an outer chamber and there were men there that I saw up on a second story behind me there was an open space and there was a couple of men up there when I started but as I got to preaching man that, that whole upstairs they just came to it and they were pressed up against that kind of like chicken wire. And man it was just packed in there and Boy, God had given me a message and I went in there and preached the gospel to those men and man, I had a tremendous liberty. It was just a, one of those services where you just wish that every service was like that. I was preaching to those men. Man, I was preaching hard and I was preaching on the love of God and the gospel and Jesus and the resurrection and man, I gave the invitation. I don't remember how many men came forward but man, they just came forward to be saved and they, we dealt with all of them with our Christian workers and got names of these men here and we rejoiced with them. And then it was amazing. Why in the world somebody would think this or pray this or say this? I don't have any idea, but a man came to me, one of the inmates came to me and tears were streaming down his face and he said, we have been praying and I don't remember how long he'd been praying, but he said we had been praying that we could have somebody from America preach to us. That's what he said. We had been praying that somebody from America would come and pre preach to us. we have been praying for you. We didn't know it, but you're the one. You know, God opened that door. Listen, when God opens doors, amen, somebody's going to walk through it. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 9 speaks of a door of effectual. The Bible says in a great door and effectual. That word effectual means having adequate power or force to produce uh, uh, the effect of the gospel. For a great door and effectual is open to me and there are many adversaries. So we know that God gave him a grand opportunity to preach the gospel but he was not to, but he was not to expect that either Satan or wicked men would, uh, would leave him alone, leave him unmolested. He says, there's a great door and affection open to me, and there are many adversaries. Believe me, we're going to face adversaries this week. Amen. It's a great door and effectual. And listen, when you're dealing with the souls of men and the gospel, there are forces at work that want to hinder the gospel. They don't want people to be saved, but thank God when God opens the door, Nobody's able to shut it but God. Colossians chapter 4 verse 3 speaks of a door of utterance with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Amen. That is a cause to communicate the doctrines of the gospel. Amen. He's opened the door. Somebody's got to walk through the door. Amen. We can't expect somebody else to do it, we got to be willing to do it, amen. Souls need to be saved. I want you to notice what he says here 
He says, notice what the Lord says, number one, about their strength. He says, thou hast a little strength. So God says to this Philadelphian church, I want you to understand that I know that you have a little strength. But there's a lesson that we can learn from that little strength, amen. You see, the truth is God doesn't need political strength. God doesn't need denominational strength. God doesn't need majority strength. God doesn't need influential strength. Listen, he says, thou hast a little strength. Listen, goodness gracious, the Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Amen. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature needs a preacher. Amen. Thou hast a little strength. Our strength is in God. Our strength is in the blood of Christ. Our strength is in the gospel. It's absolutely miraculous. When you have the preaching of the gospel, people get saved. Where you have no preaching of the gospel, they remain in darkness. One of my short-term mission trips, I was preaching in, in, in Kenya, Africa. I flew into Nairobi, and then as we were making our way over to the western part of the country near the border of Uganda, we went down into a village. Uh, I don't remember the name of it. There was a man by the name of Brother Francis, and I'll never be able to pronounce his last name. He was a man that was working at the Nairobi airport. A friend of mine who's gone to heaven now, I wish you would have had the privilege to meet him. His name was Dr. Wendell Runyon. Dr. Runyon is the, was the director back in those days of a mission organization called International Baptist Outreach Missions out of Asheville, North Carolina. Well, Dr. Runyon had gone to Nairobi, to Kenya, to look for some churches to partner with for church planning. He got to the airport there at uh, Nairobi, and he was waiting for his luggage. And this man, this young man, Brother Francis, he came, and he was wanting to help Dr. Runyon with his luggage. And Dr. Runyon took the, took the opportunity and began to share the gospel with him, and Brother Francis got saved. Brother Runyon just spent a little time with him and then he had to come back to America. But he said, Brother Francis, this is what I want you to do. I want you to read these verses, these passages in the Bible and then I want you to write down all of your questions and then I will call you every Friday night or every Saturday night via long distance and I will answer your questions. Dr. Runyon, my dear friend that's gone to heaven now, discipled this man, Brother Francis, via a long-distance telephone from America to Kenya, Nairobi, uh, Nairobi, Kenya, Africa. Well, Brother Francis had surrendered to preach. The village that we were down into was the village that he was raised at, born and raised. They didn't have any electricity in that little village. We were giving away little bags of cornmeal and little, uh, little uh, bottles of oil. Can you imagine if we got on the radio or the TV and said, we're going to be giving out cornmeal and oil here at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Flint. Everybody, if you want some cornmeal and oil, come on to the church and we'll give it to you. How many people do you think would show up? Not very many. They'd say, where's the fish or where's the chicken to go with it or something, amen. And, uh, but that's how I put it, just a poor place. They didn't have any electricity. They just have uh, coal oil, kerosene lamps. And Brother Runyon asked me to preach the first message in that village. To be honest with you, I didn't really want to. I, 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 it was such a heavy responsibility. I was hoping somebody else would do it, but Brother Runyon said, you do it. So I'm preaching my message. We're getting to the point now where I've got to wrap it up. I gotta, I'm going to have to give the invitation. I want to give the invitation over to Brother Runyon and let him do it, but he said, no, no, you do it. I'm like man I am nervous about this I'm nervous I mean I, I don't know if I understand everything that I need to understand so I just proceeded on and I began to give the invitation and the very first people who responded to the gospel call was the seniors the older people in the village and it was striking to me because they just stepped forward as I gave instructions on come to do this and we will show you how to be saved and then it was the older other folks came after that and I looked over at Brother Francis 
there were tears streaming down those black cheeks of his and he looked at me and he says brother Areza he said this is very unusual being that the adults are the first ones to respond it like sets a precedence in other words it's speaking that what these men are saying and doing and who they're speaking of is truth when the seniors accept it the children the people behind them naturally follow well there's a church now in that village where there's gospel preaching people get saved where there's no gospel preaching it remains in darkness God opens up a door of utterance for the preaching of the word of God behold I've set before thee an open door you see that's why God doesn't need political strength or influential strength He's all powerful, amen? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Psalm 18, verse 32. It is God that giveth me, uh, that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. So verse 39. For thou hast girded me with strength under the battle. Thou hast subdued under me those that rose up against me. I'm telling you, God is our strength. Psalm 28, verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song I will praise him. Amen. You see, God opened the door for them, the same reason he will do it for us. He says you have a little strength, and recognize that little strength in God's hand is omnipotent strength. Amen. So the church of Philadelphia is an example of a loyal remnant, a remnant that has been called out by the Holy Ghost of God uh, and they willingly bearing the testimony to the whole counsel of God by word and by deed, thou hast a little strength. And then he says next, thou hast kept the word of God. Amen. Now this means, this word kept the word of God, it means to guard. It has a strong implication, meaning to keep unmarred, to keep it pure, to guard it. Now, verse number 10, he says, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. It's amazing that God mentions it again. And that word patience means cheerful and hopeful, endurance, constancy, enduring patience, patiently continuing. So we know this has to be in reference to the rapture, amen. Sound doctrine is to be kept guarded, amen. When your attitude uh, 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 about coming into the local autonomy, the local church authority and Bible-based ministry, you cannot overlook the importance of the authority of Scripture. You see, it is the Word of God that dictates our beliefs about soul winning. It's the Word of God that dictates our beliefs about missions. It's the Word of God that dictates our beliefs about preaching. It's the Word of God that dictates our beliefs about biblical separation from, uh, to God from the world. It's the Word of God that dictates our biblical role models of male and female. It's, our, it's, a, it's the Word of God that dictates that church is for the glory of God, not for the glory of the flesh. We don't need lights. We don't need smoke. We don't need rock music. We don't need a leg show. We just need the Word of God and the power of God. That's what we need. You see, it is the word of God that dictates the promise of open doors for the gospel is given to the local autonomous indigenous church. And he says, thou hast kept my word. Now who is the my that he's talking about there when he says, thou hast kept my word? Who is the my? Well, the my in that verse is Jesus Christ. The my in that verse is the faithful witness the my in that verse is the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, the one that washes from our sins in his own blood, the one in the midst of the seven candlesticks, the one clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, uh, and his name is called the word of God, the one that has a garment down to the foot. Who is the my when he says, thou hast kept my word? The my is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the one with the eyes as a flame of fire, the one with the voice as in many waters, the one that liveth and was dead and is alive forevermore, amen, the one that has the keys of hell and death. He 
he says, listen, I've opened the door for the utterance of the gospel and nobody can shut it. And you better recognize you have a little strength, but that little strength you have is connected to one that is omnipotent, that has all power. And he says to this Philadelphian church, I've opened the door because thou hast kept my word. Amen. Without the authority of Scripture, we could all drift down the current of pragmatism and human reasoning. We better anchor ourselves to the Word of God. Amen. And by the way, His Word is perfect. It's inspired. It's inerrant. It's infallible. It's everlasting. And thank God we can hold it in our hands. Amen. That old-fashioned, old-timey King James Bible. Perfect Word of God. He says, I'm going to open a door. Nobody can shut it. You recognize strength. You have a little strength. But your little strength is connected to omnipotent power. He says to the church of Philadelphia, Thou hast kept my word. And then lastly, he says, Thou hast not denied my name. Now let me ask you a question. How does somebody deny his name? What does he mean by that? Thou hast not denied my name. Well, for us to understand where he says to this church, Thou hast not denied my name. Maybe we need to understand how somebody does deny his name. So the word deny means to, uh, he's, it means to not denied means to be not contradicted. It means to dis, be disavowed, not rejected. You see, during the times of persecution, Christians were brought before heathen magistrates. And these pagan authorities would often, they often tested Christians by commanding these Christians to blaspheme the name of Christ under the penalty of death. And they were mandated to, to renounce the name of Jesus Christ and to disown him in a public manner. So it's possible that amidst the persecutions that raged during the, these early times, the members of the church at Philadelphia had been summoned to maybe such a trial. And they had stood the trial firmly. Thou hast not denied my name. But to deny his name can also mean to deny the power and the authority and the promise and the hope that are attached to his name. Listen to this verse here, Psalm 91 verse 14. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. Matthew 18, 20, a very popular verse on prayer. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. How about this one, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you even unto the end of the world. Amen. John 14, 13, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He said to this church, Thou hast not denied my name. Acts 4.12 Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and that is the lovely name of Jesus Christ. And then Hebrews chapter 2 verse 12 saying I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Behold I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it. I'm saying to you, Lighthouse Baptist Church of Flint, Michigan, you have a little strength. Thou hast not, amen, denied my name. And he says, uh, and uh, that second point, he says, uh, denied my name and thou hast kept my word. You see, we, we really are not looking 
for any easy way out. We don't have to buy some marketing technique, pay into some kind of uh, socialing, socializing or marketing the gospel thing. Man, it's just right here in the Bible. It's just Christians telling other people that they need to be born again. And thank God we have the power of the Holy Ghost of God that is going before us. We're not taking him into a world. He is already out there. He is doing his work. He is the convictor, amen. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judge. A great open door has been set before us. And when a door opens up, somebody's going to walk through it. Now, I just believe that God has opened a door this week. That's why I'm here. Amen? And he's given us this number of young people and dedicated workers. And we're going to work and we're going to pray. We're going to work and we're going to pray. And good Lord willing, we're going to see many, many people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what we want. That's what we're desiring. That's what we're working for. Because God has opened the door. And when he opens it, nobody else can shut it but him. But somebody's got to walk through the door. Amen. Now that's us. Let's do it. I want us to stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Everybody standing. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let me ask you some questions this evening as we go to prayer here shortly. First of all, I'd like to ask you, how many of you could honestly say, Brother Oliver, I don't have any doubt whatsoever. Now listen to what I'm saying to you this evening. Listen to what I'm saying. Preacher, I don't have any doubt whatsoever. If something tragic were to happen to me, now God forbid that that would be the case. But preacher, if something tragic were to happen to me, I don't have a single doubt. I know absolutely for sure that I'd go to heaven and I could give you a Bible reason why I believe I'm going to heaven when I die. I believe I could back it up with the scriptures on why I know I'm going to heaven. I'm saved and I know it. Would you lift your hand up as a testimony? Saved and know it. Isn't that wonderful? If you're happy to be saved tonight, how about a good hearty amen? amen. Isn't it wonderful to be saved? Praise the Lord. Wonderful. Go ahead and put your hands down. Now that was a blessing to see all of those hands raised. Now I'm not absolutely sure if every hand was raised. There could have been one that didn't raise your hand or maybe you raised it but you shouldn't have. There's something that you need to understand. You need to be honest. And if you raised your hand that you were saved and you were not saved, listen, the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. You gotta, you gotta be honest. If you won't be honest, then you're never gonna get the help that you need. Amen? Never get the help that you need so you have to learn to be honest. Now if you've been saved, you know it. If you haven't been saved, you know it too. And let's take care of that tonight. Now, while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to, first I want to talk to the church tonight. I wonder how many members of Lighthouse Baptist Church would say, Preacher, would you pray for me? I need to recognize, I know that we're not gigantic and we're not um, what they call mega church. We got a little strength. But our little strength is connected to the omnipotent power of God. And I need to remember that. I need to remember that and I need to think about that. Boy, God spoke to my heart. Could I see your hand lifted up real high? I need to remember that. You do. Man, listen, we just we think that it's up to us to push it through and to get it done, but God is all powerful. Go ahead, good. Put your hands down. Thank you so much. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. He says, thou hast not, he says, denied my name. Let's be true to the name of Jesus Christ and let's be true to his word. Now, while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I wonder this evening, how many would say, preacher, would you pray for me? I could not raise my hand that I'm saved. 
and that I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. But I want to be saved. I want to know for sure in my heart that I'm saved and I know it. Would you pray for me? I want to know and I believe that God is speaking to my heart about being saved. Would you pray for me tonight? Would you lift your hand up real high and let me have a prayer for you? Pray for me. I want to know for sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. Lift your hand up real high. God bless you. There's one, there's two, three. There's many hands there. God bless you. Wonderful, wonderful. You can, go, you, you can go ahead and put your hands down. Thank you so much. Very tender-hearted young people here tonight. We recognize that we are sinners before God. And because we are sinners before God, we are going to have to face an eternal judgment. Not because God doesn't love us, but because that's a penalty of sin. God showed his love to us by giving us his son, Jesus Christ. And he paid our sin debt so that we could be saved by grace through faith. Now, while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask these precious young people that raise their hand, Preacher, I want to know for sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. Would you pray for me? Would you be so kind to lift your head up and look at me for just a minute? Thank you so much for being so kind. Here's what I'd like for you to do. If you'd just be willing to step out and meet Brother Jesse right here, we're going to have somebody take the Bible and show you how to be saved. Won't you slip out right now and come on up? Yep, come on up here right now. All of you that raise your hand, slip out right now. There's one, there's two. There are others that raise their hand. Let's step forward and let's get this taken care of. we got one, two, three. There's four. Anybody else need to come? Let's take care of it right now. All right, we need some ladies here, some of these young ladies from the church here. And we need some other workers. Bring your testament with you so we can lead these young people to the Lord. All right, very good. All right, Brother Jesse, we've got it taken care of. Thank you very, very much. Now, while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I wonder would there be some that say, Preacher, pray for me. I've been saved, but now that I'm saved, I need to follow the Lord in baptism. Pray for me. I need to, be, I need to follow Christ in baptism. Could I see your hand? Anybody like that tonight? I need to be baptized now that I'm saved. All right. Now with our heads bowed and eyes closed, and we're going to go to prayer right after this. How many would say, Brother Oliver, pray for me. I need to be so much better at soul winning. I need to be so much better at evangelizing. I know that God opens doors for me. And I need to be the kind of Christian that won't deny his name, that will keep his word, that will understand the strength that we're given through the power of the gospel and the Holy Ghost. And I need to be so much better at soul winning. Pray for me, preacher. Could I see your hand? Would you lift it up real high? God bless you all. I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing on this invitation. As soon as I say amen, our brother's going to play the invitation number for us. When he hits that first note, I want you to slip to the nearest aisle, whether it's the inside or outside, and find a place at the altar. Amen. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. God opens these doors. He opens these doors for the effectual work of the gospel. For those of us that are saved, opening doors to utter the gospel to the lost. But we got to walk through it. We got to be filled with the Spirit. We've got to have tracks ready. We got to be ready and willing to, to communicate the gospel. Father, we come now in the precious name of Jesus. Lord, this is, what, this is what our cities in America need. God, we just need, we need you. And we need to take our responsibilities serious. And Lord, we need to feel the burden of it, dear God. Lord, we need to recognize, Lord, we, 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 we feel very puny and powerless. No doubt like this church felt. But Lord, we are connected to the source of all power and authority and help us to believe it and to practice it implement it help us to keep your word help us to not deny your name and Lord help us Lord to be witnesses and soul winners and bless the fruit of the labor and thank you for this wonderful church that's stepping out on faith
for this event. Bless it, all of it, everything that goes on with it. Keep everybody safe and bless the labor, bless the efforts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As the brother plays invitation number for us, God has touched your heart. Won't you humble yourself tonight? And let's find a place at this old-fashioned altar. Amen. And let's just say, Lord, I know what you call me to do, to call me to be. And I feel very puny about it. Like, what can I do? What can I be? What can I say? But good night, that little strength that we have when it's connected to God, it's powerful. And we need to believe it. Thank you for your attention. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. What a great day and what a great way to approach the next three days. I hope that you'll be in prayer. I kind of was excited this morning. Brother Reza and Pastor Jesse met with all of our teenagers and all of our volunteers for the next three days. And basically we said, okay, we're going to pray and dismiss. Then everybody that's going to volunteer move over to this section we pray to dismiss said amen it's like the whole church just moved over to this section i'm excited about that it tells me that you're excited about what god's going to do the next three days i heard a man give an illustration once regarding our part and god's part and i think it per perfectly sums it up when you're going to go to vacuum the carpet in your living room if you just pull the vacuum cleaner out and push it around the room, the carpet's not going to get cleaned. If you take the cord off and plug it in and turn it on, but you don't push it around the room, it's not going to get cleaned. You've got to take the cord off, plug it in, turn it on, and then push it around the room. God's that power source. We've got to pray and get on our faces and ask God to do what only he can do. And then once we've prayed, then we get up off of our faces, get on our feet, and go out and do the work. And so I hope that you'll be praying and laboring along with us the next three days. We'll be sure to keep you abreast of all the results of everything that's been happening. I know four young ladies left the room tonight to pray to receive Christ, and we trust that they'll be saved. They're still being dealt with. Uh, let's receive our offering at this time, please, for Brother Areza, Brother Russ, and Brother Ashton. Come on down, please, gentlemen. Everything that comes in this particular offering will go to Brother Areza for his love offering. Please do realize that he left North Carolina yesterday at 7 p.m., got into the hotel at 5, almost 5.30 this morning, drove all night long, and then he's preached all day for us, and uh, we're going to work him like a dog next three days. And, uh, and so the laborer is worthy of his hire. Let's be sure to be generous and give tonight. Would you please help? For the rest, would you pray?
let's see, where's Amaya? Where are you, Amaya? Would you stand up real quick, Amaya? And where's Phoenix? Phoenix in here? Phoenix? These two young ladies pray to receive Christ as Savior tonight. Would you give them a big hand? Good job, ladies. Praise the Lord. You may be seated, ladies. Thank you very much. Isn't that good? Uh, let me give you some announcements. We'll have you on your way. First off, teenagers, as soon as we dismiss, we're going to have you come to the center section. Pastor Jesse needs to meet with you just for a few minutes before you head out and get on the buses tonight. Uh, first, uh, a bit of a personal need here. Uh, Jeanette Dix has a family she's trying to help. There's a 10-month-old little girl and a 3-year-old little boy. They need some supplies for these kids. Uh, there's a single dad in a situation and needs some help. So if you could help with anything regarding that, just see Jeanette, would you please, and let her know that you want to help. Our prayer emphasis, as we've been saying all day today, is for Operation Soul Storm. Please be in prayer. But let's bathe this week in prayer so that we can see God do what only he can do. Bible reading, beginners, you're going to read the book of Numbers, chapters 10 through 36. Advanced readers, you're reading Exodus 26 through Numbers, chapter number 8. Our Wednesday night service time will be 6.15 p.m. Uh, we run a certain schedule for Operation Soul Storm. In fact, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, we'll have services at 615. You're welcome to attend adults, uh, but just please come and, and spectate maybe from the back of the auditorium. But you're more than welcome to come. We'd be honored to have you join us. And certainly for Wednesday night on that final evening, why don't you come? And it uh, won't be our normal Bible study, but I promise you, you'll want to be here to see what the Lord's doing. So that's 615 the next three nights. Soul Winning Thursday night is still going to be held. It'll be 7 o'clock on the Soul Winning bus. I hope you'll join us for that. We have not 6,323 doors so far in the city. Uh, we're planning on knocking all of them, so we've only got 33,000 more to go, but they will get knocked. Amen. Salvation's year to date, we, we know we're at least at 86, and 12 of those have been baptized. There is a ladies' activity coming up on August the 8th, and then the 9th through the 12th will be our vacation Bible school. Those of you two teenagers who haven't gotten your T-shirts yet for uh, Soul Storm, see Pastor Jesse. He has those for you. And then, let's see, I think that's all that we've got in terms of announcements. One more time, teenagers, as soon as we pray here and dismiss, just come to the center section, please. And uh, Brother Jesse has some things for you. All right, let's stand to our feet. We'll pray and be dismissed. Thank you for being here. What a good day in the Lord's house. Uh, let me mention to you, Brother Areza has a book table over here. Please come by, peruse it, look at what he has to offer, and if you find something you like, purchase it from him, all right? And then we do have some gifts for you. Ladies, we picked up some uh, little uh, accordion fans so that you can fan yourself when it gets a little too warm in here. And we didn't figure you men would like those, so we've got beef jerky sticks over there for you guys. Uh, if you ladies would rather have a beef jerky instead of an accordion fan, God bless you. You men who'd rather have a fan than a beef jerky, I don't know you. Uh, so <laughs> keep that in mind, all right? But God bless you. Be in prayer for Brother Areza this week and Pastor Jesse and all the volunteers who will be laboring and working, okay? Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for a wonderful day in your house. Thank you for the wisdom and experience and ministry of Brother Areza and what a blessing it's been to us already. Help us to be a blessing to him, please, as the week goes on. Be with his wife as she's visiting their daughter and Please be with her and comfort her and help her through this time. We sure do love you. We're a grateful people. We ask all of this tonight in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed. Teenager, center section, please.